Okay, so how's my hair? Depressing. Thanks, douchebag. Uh, okay, so let's let's run uh, a couple of these real quick, okay? Shadowlands' new feature is Torgastic. No, I, I don't think so. Shadowlands' newest feature on the alpha is a Tor Blast. <laughs> That's, um, you know, no, no. Have you heard about Shadowlands' newest feature? It is Torrific. Okay, that's definitely a, the, okay. That's definitely a just no. Oh my god! Oh, this is it. I'm gonna have a torgasm. Omg! Stop. Okay, how about this one? It's this is a really good one. Just read it, okay? This one? Okay. Uh, it's uh, torgast. It doesn't suck so far. Right? Really? That's it. That's that's what we're gonna go with. We're not going to do Torgasm, we're a family channel. Hey, it's Sol, complete with emo haircut, and welcome back to another episode of Warcraft Weekly, your one-stop shop for Torgast news and updates. Can you tell I'm going to have good things to say about Torgast later? Anyway, today's show, like last week's, and last week's before that, and next week's, is going to be brought to you by the incredible supporters of this channel, like Pony Hunter, Lenlock, and Menergy. Menard, who together they gifted tons of Twitch subs. And there's the patrons like Valara, Colton, David, Mina, and Kevro29. Thank you all so much for supporting my brand of news and commentary. You got your money, bitch. Now start dancing. Yes, sir, Bob. Today, many of us are under shelter-in-place orders by state and local governments, giving us the time to spend with loved ones, work on projects long neglected, start working out, work on bettering ourselves, and lying about all of that while binging on Netflix and ordering fast food delivery and, well, specific to us, playing a lot of World of Warcraft. A big chunk of WoW players are having a little bit of a harder time enjoying themselves compared to the rest of us, though, and that's the chunk of WoW Classic players, who specifically play in high-population realms. For months now, these realms have been plagued with long queues, mostly due in part that so many people are staying home. And not because holy moly Zul Grub is out this week, which it is. Woo! A recent post by Blizzard encourages discussion on how players would feel if, as a temporary stopgap, layering was turned back on for these specific realms that are the most impacted. The results were you know, mixed, to say the least. It was one part, hey, let's make fun of WoW Classic fans for giving in to the quality of life comforts that today's modern game has. It's another part, hey, we're gonna stand our ground because this, more than anything else, would damage the sanctity of Classic. And it's partially, you know, dudes, I just wanna play the darn game. It's hard to blame Blizzard for a lack of a trying with realms that are far, far larger than their original levels at, at Classic WoW's launch. They've also offered free transfers and have thus and have since restricted character creation and transfers to impacted realms. And finally, they resorted to starting this conversation because, crazy as it might sound, they care about what we think of making a move this big. My thoughts on this are mixed as usual. I mean, I don't have skin in the game. I don't play WoW Classic, but... You know, it messes with the total community vibe. We don't know how long it's going to be before local governments start lifting these stay-at-home orders, so these queues could potentially grow larger or grow worse before players really start getting fed up and they outright quit, because they'd rather do that than to just transfer off of their realms. So a part of me is like, yeah, go ahead and do it, do this layering thing. This is definitely what I would consider an exceptional circumstance. But if layering is added to these realms, this may solve the queue problem, but it could also cause floods of players who might already have characters on those realms to just come right back. It's the old bag space argument in WoW. I mean, sure, they can, you know, Blizzard can make bigger and bigger bags, but all we're gonna do is fill it up with more crap. Speak for yourself. I am. In the end, though, it's hard to feel all that compassionate for these players who stubbornly refuse to just be a part of a less populated server. You know, back then, as soon as the dust began to settle over in WoW Classic Land. These people wanted the big city feel, so here you go. This week, the Hall of Fame for Mythic Nihilotha finally completed, and like in previous records, was done roughly a month after the Horde completed their Hall of Fame. So, for the most part, the divide of skill between the Horde and Alliance has been consistent throughout this expansion. Never mind whatever nerfs came in and the greater accessibility of essences on alts, or farming corrupted gear from horrific visions, minor details, you know, go Alliance. 
The 100% experience bonus is going to be extended until the Shadowlands pre-patch, uh, as in like forever, which is both totally awesome and an indirect sign that, man, we are going to be stuck here for a long ass time, aren't we? But hey, there's more. A new shelter at home buff is going to last from April 20th to May 18th, where all reputation gains for Legion and Battle for Azeroth factions, with the exception for the ones that matter, the Ultim Accord and the Rajani, is going to be doubled. Cool. Now all those WoWhead comments naysaying can edit their posts to praise Blizzard for making the right move, but they probably won't. Okay, so with all the small stuff out of the way, let's get right into the meat of today's weekly, the second Shadowlands alpha build that dropped on a Thursday. Thanks. I'm going to cover the non-spoiler highlights from this build that I didn't get to cover from throughout this week, which means, you know, just about all of it, but I'm going to try to stick to the good stuff. Like Torghast. Oh, Bob speaks my mind. Like, like literally, yeah. First, there was a full update on the character creation screen, which looks fantastic. It makes the old character creation screen look super dated, while this one is a much closer look to a 2020 feel. It'd be even more in line with the times if the characters were spaced out a little bit more responsibly. Seriously though, this is a great first look, and it's still missing most of the snazzy character customizations, but when those start to show up in future builds, that is when I'm going to dive in. I'll take a look and I'll share my thoughts on it with you all, so stay tuned for that. In light of the upcoming customization though, I definitely think characters should be zoomed in like way more than this so we can see all the details later on. Alright, let's move to a few more visuals. The sleepless team over at WoWhead data mined a ton of stuff, including what looks to be the dungeon sets for all four armor types. These obviously have a titan feel to them, especially the plate set over here. It also appears that there are different color tints of these just like in Battle for Azeroth to correspond the difficulty that these sets come from. Here's a small issue that I have though, at least so far. BFA has two entirely different dungeon sets for Horde and Alliance, whereas in Shadowlands there's only this one so far. That might not mean much to people who only play as one faction, but the reality of it is that faction identity in Shadowlands won't be a thing, which is alright. But in exchange, the efforts have moved to Covenant identity. Also, it's been said in interviews that class-themed armor could make a return in a later Shadowlands patch, so that ought to give us a bit more to look forward to. Oh, and a quick shout out to male wearers. It looks like your sets are looking better than usual. Finally, there's a fishing pole. What more efficient method is there to catch fish than the strands of death? Hmm. This build also introduced conduits, the last talked about thing in Shadowlands so far because, to be fair, we still don't know jack about them even after this build. These items are meant to slot into Soulbinds, the selection of talent trees that we get for a Covenant. The nature of these items seems to be based both on class, and spec, and role, so it's hard to tell if Conduits are going to be items that totally redefine our playstyle like Azerite traits try to, or if they just let us play into our strengths, show up our weaknesses, and that sort, so basically the more nuanced min-maxing. It also looks like Covenants will have reputation contracts, so our interactions with zones that we're not aligned with won't end after their main storylines are completed. Can I talk about Torghast now? Yes. Yes! Torghast, the so-called endless dungeon in Shadowlands was made available in this alpha build, and somewhere I'm going to have a link that will run you through all the basics. For now though, I'm going to run through my initial thoughts and feedback while incorporating a recent interview that Tell the Tank did with Paul Cubitt, the kind of czar of Torghast. If you'd like a mostly unedited version of my experiences in Torghast, or if you want to take a look at the Towel interview, if it's available, check out the links below. For those of you who still don't know enough about Torghast, here's the really quick gist. You go in, and your objective is to climb the tower to the point where you reach some sort of milestone that gets you some snazzy rewards. You know, mostly stuff to craft legendaries. Then you can climb higher for additional challenge, maybe some cosmetic rewards, renown, or whatever. The strategy in Torghast comes from a bit of luck, but to also collect from a selection of anima powers that define an ideal build that will let you climb higher. You can be a mage that has superior self-healing, or a healer with explosive capability, maybe a tank who spawns a bunch of rats, whatever. Not all classes were eligible to test Torghast in this particular build, so in my first run I ran in as a discipline priest. 
The basics are very easy to understand. You just kill everything you see with the tools that you've got. So for in my example, early on, I was going around mind controlling mobs to wear them down until I can pick up some cool anima powers that enhanced my stuff. And there are a ton of powers that alter the experience in different ways. One made me move faster if I was hugging walls. Another altered the power of my covenant ability. Another again altered the power of my class abilities, while another just gave me more maximum HP or crit chance. I even got a temporary buff that gave me Divine Shield for well over a minute. And of course, I got powers that let me blow up rats with devastating results. One critical component that didn't seem to impact my run was a mechanic that made enemies stronger the higher that I climbed, which meant that by the time I climbed enough floors, I obtained so many different anima powers and, and I should point out that most of the powers I previously mentioned, that they stack. So I'm rocking like five times my normal maximum HP. My Covenant ability cooldown was, was reduced to one minute, down from three minutes. My crit was something like 50%. I was taking 75% reduced damage from fire. I reflected 100% of the damage that I actually took. It's just a lot of stuff that, that goes on. But I was still having such a fun time. Uh, the problem was that I had too many anima powers, which is something that will be addressed before the Shadowlands goes live. Walking into Torghast is like walking out of the world of Warcraft and into this different game, locked into this endless interior dungeon that thankfully takes place both inside and outside of Torghast. And true to form, there's no timer. I could wait for cooldowns to refresh for the most part. I can eat, I can go to the bathroom without worrying about mob packs that patrolled too far. But your sense of urgency does come from screwing up, dying. In Torghast, dying a number of times on the same floor is going to activate the Terra Gru, AKA the Bouncer, AKA Johnny, who's gonna come out and destroy you if you're in aggro range. And once this Terra Gru is out, the sense of urgency begins. Your objective then is to make it to the next floor before it does. If you're successful, the death count is reset to zero and you're pretty much good to go once again. If you don't, then you're kicked out and it's game over. Torghast is a roguelike dungeon crawl. I walked in to see how a healer would do, and so far they can succeed with some clever play and with a little bit of luck from anima powers. Currently in the alpha, Torghast detects your roll and adjusts mob health, kind of like how Horrific Visions does now. But when this goes live, Torghast is going to scale based on your spec, because a Disc Priest probably does more damage than a Holy Priest, which does arguably less damage than a Holy Paladin. But Torghast also puts a lot of emphasis on your class. I never used mind control so much before, but here I am, mind controlling rats because it made nearby rats breed? And then I'd pull them into mobs and blow everything up. That was successful at least until I picked up Thorn's damage, and then the rats that followed me would get hurt, and then they would run away, which totally ruined my bombing strategy, until I picked up another power that made the rats not run away after taking damage. It's fun. <laughs> there's a lot of good there's a lot going on but it's fun i think many of the alpha testers have shared in their delight and excitement over this feature's potential which leads me to the age-old question will they limit the runs the interview with paul cubit didn't reveal any concrete information but it did fill us in on the ideas that they do have the long and short of it is that yes they do want to have some sort of limitation. Because imagine starting your Torghast run and your first anima power on the first floor just kind of sucks. It's not your best in slot, so you're like, ah, screw it, I'm gonna leave. And then come back to re-roll your anima power again and again until it is your best in slot. That's probably not a great idea. It also wouldn't be a great idea to throw some sort of deserter debuff if you just happen to walk out in the first couple of minutes because, well, then you would just do the same thing but with a half hour cooldown, and well, that also sucks. But they are interested in giving a free key out every few days, something that I've been campaigning for in Horrific Visions. Shut up. Paul also introduced the idea of farming for keys in the Maw, the endgame zone in Shadowlands. But there's only a limited amount of time that you can spend in the Maw per day before the Jailer makes being there a total nightmare. Think of it like if you're standing around, you look sort of suspicious, but if you're going around going murder face, killing rares and looting stuff, then you're going to gain stars like in Grand Theft Auto, and eventually tanks are going to start running you over. But there's also a gameplay loop that will let you lower that star count. 
it's still kind of vague. They didn't have uh, enough concrete stuff, but Blizzard is definitely learning their lesson on hard gating these modes. And my guesstimation is that a normal player isn't going to need any more than a few runs per week to be optimal. Whereas no lifers like me can probably run it maybe five to 10 times a week with some effort. Given how long it takes to complete these runs though, I don't need that many runs. The point is that this is the world of Warcraft and not the world of Torghast. I think I can accept that. So let's wrap things up. The Horrific Vision project is nearly complete with most classes done except for the mage, but this week's alpha build is sort of, you know, got in the way. That's also why you haven't seen a lot of vision commentary lately, but don't worry, it's gonna start trickling its way back into the fold starting next week while I play catch up in my deeper dives into the alpha. As a channel, we've been kicking a lot of ass. We're getting closer to 34,000 subscribers. Can we get to 35 before the end of the month? Probably not, but it's still exciting to see tons of fresh new faces. So if you haven't already, I think you should consider subscribing if you want to hear about WoW news in this, you know, in this weird way that I do it. No matter what, though, I appreciate all of you folks at home and on the toilet for making it to the end. I love all you folks, and I will see you next week. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay breezy.